Good evening, dear students. Uh, so, welcome to this uh, last lecture on uh, research and publication ethics. So, uh, in this lecture, so basically, I will try to talk to you something about uh, predatory publishing and journals. But before that, uh, probably I thought uh, I should give you a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge about. Uh, how uh, uh, the publication industry actually works so that you can understand the effect of predatory publishing better. So let's get started <clears throat> with uh, what is the current status or what has it, has it been all these years down the line. So if you look at uh, the way uh, results or research results or scientific results have been communicated down the ages. So in the very good olden days, there were individual scientists working on uh, as lone wolves, for example, and they used to uh, put down their result on paper or something uh, in the Western world. In the Indian uh, context, uh, people transferred this knowledge mostly orally and uh, they used to write in the form of books and some of them still exist uh, to this day. So sometime maybe around uh, uh, 100 years or so, I think uh, the first uh, print journals started uh, coming up where one could publish uh, uh, scientific uh, research uh, results. So to start with basically the print journals, which were the norm for publishing scientific research. And one had to subscribe to these uh, journals. And usually it was done through the institutions, the libraries, where they could uh, subscribe for these print journals. And then uh, once the journals uh, have been subscribed, you get the journals in the library and then the knowledge is to get uh, disseminated. Now, one major issue has been that uh, the publication, uh, publishing costs have really gone up in the last uh, three, four decades or so. And uh, so having to subscribe to these uh, printed uh, journals turns, turned out to be fairly uh, expensive for many uh, libraries. And if you look at the Indian context, especially, many libraries in the country, uh, many university libraries, they started to stop subscriptions because they were too expensive. They just didn't have the budgets to support these subscriptions. And uh, the net result is that uh, people did not get to uh, read the uh, required scientific journals. And uh, so in, in principle, they were not accessible to the scientific community by and large because of this very high subscription rates. So only with very few uh, top universities or the big organizations in the country would actually afford to subscribe to these uh, printed journals. And uh, for those who are working in these big institutions would of course still readily access these, uh, these journals. And how were these research results uh, communicated to these journals? So basically the scientific or community or the scientists, they were required to submit manuscripts that were typed or printed uh, physically to journals for consideration. And uh, for example, on after due uh, review process and everything, and if the paper has been accepted, the authors were required to uh, pay certain publication charges for the paper to appear in print early. And of course, this was not followed by all the journals. Some of the more popular uh, journals uh, had these conditions where one had to pay certain publication charges. Uh, if you didn't uh, pay the charges, of course, you had to wait in a general queue for a free slot to come up. So your manuscript used to be put in a queue uh, for the pre uh, queue, and then uh, uh, it used to get ultimately published after some uh, delay. 
So this is how uh, it used to happen in the printed journal publishing uh, industry. And uh, of course, uh, all manuscripts had to undergo the mandatory peer review, etc., and all those uh, issues. And uh, then, of course, uh, if they are accepted, uh, then they will appear finally in print. So these were what are called those subscription-based uh, journals. Now, if you look at the last 20, 25 years or so, uh, the advent of uh, internet becoming uh, more and more popular, this publishing of scientific peer-reviewed papers also underwent a revolution. Basically, because the, way, the wide range of possibilities, technical possibilities, which internet offers, basically communication. So the communication of research results became so much more easy and fast that uh, the manuscripts could be simply sent by email instantly instead of rely on the postal uh, system where typically it used to take maybe one month or so to uh, travel from uh, India to say the United States. Uh, so compared to that, so this was instant. So one could submit a manuscript instantly to a journal, and after which, of course, it underwent a due process. And then, uh, once uh, the uh, referee uh, reports uh, were ready, they could also be sent back to the authors immediately by email. And uh, so, of course, this went on like that, and you could check your uh, proofs of the paper uh, as soon as possible, and then send it back to the uh, send back corrections to the editor, so that your manuscript becomes finally ready for publication. So this way, uh, very quickly, this electronic publication became the norm. And uh, that means, what do you mean by electronic publication, uh, publishing? Uh, so most of these journals, which were uh, operating in the subscription mode and physical form, uh, they started putting up the, the papers on the internet, on their websites. So that is what is meant by, uh, say, the e-journal or electronic journal. Okay. So that became uh, the, the norm. And uh, it made things so much uh, easy for uh, scientists to download uh, the required uh, papers on the journal's uh, websites. But of course, you did also require a subscription to access the internet uh, journals and papers also. So, uh, so this subscription to an e-journal that could enable the scientists or scholars to very easily download published papers on their desktops sitting in their laboratories. So that was a very big revolution which happened uh, sometime, uh, I would say, uh, in the late uh, 90s, uh, early 2000s. This uh, e-journal started becoming uh, very good. And uh, there was another uh, side to this uh, e-journals. Because it was mostly now on the internet, the cost involved in maintaining an e-journal was much less compared to uh, say a printed uh, form. So this enabled the publishers to experiment with uh, a new model in publishing, wherein anyone with internet facility can actually download and read the papers. And uh, since these articles are open for everyone to download, these are called open access articles. And some, uh, some the journals which did this, they were called the open access journals. So in an open access journal, all the papers are available for download for everyone on the internet. But then the, where is the catch here? The catch is that, uh, see how, 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 how do the journals recoup their uh, money. If, to do this, the funds and resources which were actually required for running these journals, they were recovered from the authors themselves or the institutions to which the authors belong. And the readers did not have to pay anything. 
So that was a very big uh, development which happened uh, sometime in the middle of uh, uh, early 2000. And uh, even after uh, uh, a subscription-based journal uh, brings out an e-journal, one need not uh, subscribe to the journal or the e-journal in case you wish to download, say, one single paper particular issue. So these subscription-based journals, what they did was they could allow individuals uh, to download individual articles on payment basis. So if you're a reader you could, and you have identified a particular uh, reference uh, article in a particular journal, you could simply, uh, uh, if you could afford to pay some amount of money, you could download that particular uh, article for yourself. So typically the cost of download for one particular paper could cost anywhere between say 30 to 60 uh, US uh, dollars. That is still, of course, a, a big money for uh, many of, our, of uh, our countrymen. But this was made possible. <clears throat> so then uh, the next development was that uh, these sufficient based journals, they started a new uh, method and they called it uh, the hybrid mode of subscription based journals. So, in this particular uh, mode of uh, journal, what happens is that if, if you take one particular issue of a journal, some articles in this journal that could they could be made open access on payment of some specific charges, and these were usually called as article publication charge or article uh, article processing charge. Uh, one point to remember here is if you go back to the earlier uh, case of uh, subscription based uh, journals themselves, even before the internet age came in, one had to pay to some of these journals this publication charges. And that's what I told you uh, a while ago. So this is not that publication charge. This is something different. Uh, this is article processing charge or APC. So on payment of this article processing charge, certain uh, papers in a particular issue would be made open access. So uh, if you are a scientist with uh, enough funds with you, one could actually uh, pay this uh, money to the journal and then make your particular paper provided as an accepted for publication open access so that why do you want to do this why do you need to make your uh, paper open access that is because it will ensure uh, a wider uh, wider uh, uh, exposure for for your scientific work to the general uh, readership and uh, so the funds were uh, usually provided by the author's institution and they were pretty, uh, they are really uh, fairly expensive, I would say. So if you want to make a particular paper open access in a hybrid mode journal, it can cost uh, anywhere from uh, say 3,000 to 5,000 uh, US dollars. So it is that expensive. So what, why do you need to do this? Basically, it's a purchase of extra visibility okay, at a price. And uh, so quite a large number of uh, publishing uh, houses, big publishing houses, they offered this kind of system for the uh, author groups. So, <clears throat> but then you can ask a question, uh, is this hybrid more Fair enough. Are there any ethical problems involved in this uh, hybrid? Let's see. So if an author publishes an open access article through his institution, which already subscribes to this journal, then what is actually happening? The institution is actually paying the subscription of the journal 
and also it is again paying for your particular paper in the same journal. So you are paying twice to that uh, particular journal for a, a sort of a same uh, paper. So this is what they mean by double dipping, where you dip in both the pockets and then uh, take money, uh, but ultimately giving you only one product. So it was felt that uh, there should be a concomitant decrease in the subscription rate, uh, the cost to the library, which is based on the number of uh, open access articles from that particular institute. And it's a fair enough proposition. But in reality, whether it has happened or not is not clear. So all these very big uh, publishing houses like Springer or APS or Nature, etc., which uh, espouse this uh, hybrid model, really have not actually reduced their subscription price. And also, there is not much transparency in this particular regard. There may be transparency, of course, in the other issues like uh, publication procedures and all those things, like the review process and everything. But in this particular aspect, uh, people found that uh, journals are not so forthcoming with their policies. So the net result, uh, what has happened is that, especially in Europe, all the major uh, European funding agencies have actually stopped funding this hybrid model where one can have an open access uh, paper in a subscription-based journal. Instead, they have started supporting the open access journal system in totality. So this is one uh, issue uh, which uh, comes to mind, uh, whether it is really, uh, and whether these publishing uh, houses are supporting the scientific community or then, or else making more money out of it. See, if you look at publishing uh, industry mostly these days, it is basically it's a business model, okay? it's based on a business model. So profit is the bottom line for many of these big publishing houses, other than those, of course, which have been established by certain societies on a no profit uh, basis, no profit, no loss basis. So most of these big uh, journals like uh, Springer, uh, publishing houses like Springer, Wiley, or APS, etc. So these are all uh, based on uh, certain business model. So they are not going to reduce their profits for your sake. Okay? That is going to remain as it is, if not make it more. And the problem again here is that uh, this actually discriminates against countries like India, especially, and other uh, what are called the low income countries or institutions, which do not have very large budgets for their uh, libraries and uh, scholars. So these uh, APCs, the article processing charges, are really too high for uh, such countries and uh, people from such countries. So, of course, these journals, they keep on saying that, uh, look, uh, we do have a waiver policy, uh, provided uh, that uh, they feel a particular manuscript or a paper has enormous scientific value or something, and uh, is sure to bring in uh, more impact for their journal. Probably in that case, they may still waive these uh, charges and then still go ahead and publish your paper in this open access mode for free. And then again, these uh, charges are not really sensitive to the market. Rather, they are actually closely connected to the perceived value of the publication. So it's all uh, like, uh, like fine art, for example, a painting. So who determines how much a painting would cost? So it's a perceived value. Okay. You have a painting, say, by uh, uh, Mbappé Hussein, and uh, it goes for a bidding, and you can get any amount of money. 
So it all depends on the perception. So the same case here also, these charges are actually based on the perceived value of the publication. So if it's a very star publication, uh, top of the uh, top of the mill publication like Nature, etc., naturally their charges will be much more than say uh, Institute of Physics uh, uh, publishing journal. And then there's another issue with uh, this hybrid mode of open access uh, publishing. There's a problem of discoverability. See, when an open access paper is in middle of uh, several subscription-based uh, papers, even if it's on the internet journal, e-journal, it is not so easily discoverable. Okay? And uh, so there's a problem of discoverability of open access papers in a subscription based journal. So that makes this option not uh, very viable and doesn't give the best value for money because they're actually charging much more uh, than uh, a fully open access journal would do. And uh, so more money really goes into this hybrid uh, mode, which could otherwise probably be spent uh, on more innovative and more sustainable publishing models, uh, which are now currently uh, available. So now, as compared to the subscription-based journals and hybrid mode journals, what are these truly open access publishing and uh, open access uh, journals? Now this actually, uh, these open access uh, journals, they came of age in early 2000. And initially they were actually established mostly by non-profit societies like what is called PLOS or Public Library of uh, Scientists or something it's called PLOS, a Public Library of Science, the United States and the British Medical Journal BMJ in UK. And uh, so these were the first few people who actually started these open access uh, journals. And uh, so how does the model work? So these article processing uh, charges happen to be the central means of financing the professional publishing costs. So from year 2000 onwards, this importance of uh, APC as a business model for this open access publishing has really grown uh, several times. And uh, now many of these large uh, publishing uh, houses, which are earlier based on uh, subscription journals, they started uh, having full open access journals, which are funded by the APCs. So though this whole thing was started by non-profit societies, very soon these big publishing houses, they realized the value and uh, financial uh, uh, profit possibilities and started getting into this uh, business. So these uh, open access journals uh, using this model, they can charge anywhere between uh, 1,000 to 3,000 uh, US dollars as uh, article processing charges. And this is, of course, uh, a really substantial barrier for many people, especially in the uh, third world. Because 3,000 US dollars, imagine it's like a, a full, probably a full year salary for a, it's a scholar. Okay? Or maybe a, a two months or three months salary for even a scientist. And no such uh, uh, scientist is going to uh, pay from his pocket uh, these kind of charges, unless of course the institution steps in and then pays for the uh, for the papers. So there is an issue here where uh, these uh, article processing charges are way too high for uh, the third world countries. Uh, India, no exception. Then uh, there's another advantage in this uh, open access policy. If you look at the earlier methods of subscription-based journal, when you submit a manuscript and if it gets accepted for publication, 
you had to transfer the copyright on that paper to the journal. So what do you mean by uh, saying you transfer the copyright to the journal? So basically you give away the, the right on that particular paper and uh, text which is contained in that paper, the figures, et cetera, on that paper, you transfer the entire copyright to the journal. So if someone else wants to use those figures uh, or the text part or whatever, uh, in some other uh, publication, etc., or probably even the same author would like to use a, a figure from that particular paper in another paper which he may be writing. He has to get permission from the publisher before he can do that. Otherwise, he'll be breaching copyright laws. Okay. So that was the model which used to work with the subscription-based journal. So now, in the case of open access journals. The copyright for the publication is retained by the author. So this was a very big difference. Of course, you have to pay. You have been you have paid for that, uh, that uh, copyright. Okay. So uh, once uh, you have, uh, uh, so what these open access journals will do is they have what is called the Creative Commons license, which. Uh, put on that particular publication. And uh, with these licenses, users, I mean, like other users and readers, they can share, use the uh, results. I mean, results when I say the figures or et cetera, and build upon this original work. And also many of these open access journals now have fairly good uh, impact factors it makes it uh, quite attractive to publish in those open access journals, provided, of course, you have enough funds. So this was uh, on uh, what is meant by subscription-based journals and open access uh, publishing. And also the open access journals, at least those which have been established by these uh, well-known societies, uh, like the BMJ or uh, the other one which I mentioned, uh, and also the large publishing houses, established publishing houses. They also follow the same standards of scientific peer review, same standards of production and publish, uh, publishing as followed by the subscription based journal. And, uh, but, you know, there is a problem because, you see, the whole accent is on money. So, sometimes there is a reason to believe that uh, all these standards could go for a toss in your the huge profits uh, involved. So, there could be certain open access journals which may not follow certain standards for peer review and publishing. So, in order to counter those uh, open access journals which don't follow the standards. There was a some kind of a society or an association which was formed. It was called the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. And uh, this was, of course, founded by a group of reputed uh, open access uh, publishers. So when, how do you say reputed? So either they are reputed uh, scientific societies or uh, earlier, uh, subscription based journals which have uh, transformed to open access. So uh, this particular uh, association, OASPA, this called, it strives to establish quality standards for these open access journals. So that was a good uh, development. And uh, uh, there's some questions coming in, but you can please, uh, at the end of this talk, uh, raise your hand and ask your questions again. Okay? Uh, and there's another uh, association, I think it's called uh, uh, Directory of Open Access Journals, etc. DOH, DOHJ or something. Yeah, so now one can ask a question here. Suppose uh, if the existing subscription based journals were in most of the libraries like BAE institutions, University of India, they pay for the subscription, okay? These journals are mostly based in the West. And if they 
happen to convert, all of them happen to convert themselves into open access journals, along with the requirement of article processing charges. Now, who will support papers from Indian scholars and scientists? So, is there any alternative way out for us? Because it is well known, absolutely well known, uh, absolutely clear about this that there's not much money left. Uh, there's not much money in the budgets for our uh, libraries. So, where are we going to get these uh, funds from? And what will happen when you want to publish your scientific results? Suppose, for example, in physics, you have physical review B. Suppose some years down the line, physical review B says that, look, we are now transforming ourselves into completely open access. So, if you have to publish anything, you pay. So, what is the way out? So, I ask all of you to think about this. We'll come back to this question probably at the end of the lecture. This is a very important thing. I don't know uh, how many of you have actually already thought, of, some of you might have already thought about this. So, if all present subscription journals transform themselves into open access journals, what will be the way out for our Indian uh, science? Let's see. Okay, so now uh, coming to the next uh, topic was the predatory journals and publishers. So I gave you this uh, introduction to open access publishing, etc., and the history of subscription-based journals in order for you to appreciate what do you mean by these predatory journals and publishers. Because most of these predatory journals and publishers also work on the basis of open access system, but in a very devious way. So let's see how it uh, this happens. Okay, so this is something which I got yesterday night in my email. Okay, you can't make head or tail of it, of course, because it's in Chinese, unless, of course, you know how to read Chinese. So I did simply uh, copy, uh, block, uh, uh, copy, paste it into uh, what is that, uh, Google Translate. And what do you see on the right side? So it says that EI conferences. English general publications, international monographs can be arranged. Okay. And uh, the latest call for papers is as follows call for papers in computer, blah, 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 blah. And conferences calling for papers are fourth international conference on multimodal information analysis, third international conference on artificial intelligence, tenth international conference on network intelligence efforts. God only knows. How where these numbers came from? What were the earlier conferences about? No one knows. There are less than 20 places left, and deadline is the end of this month. First come, first serve. See, the language itself tells you that look, this guy is trying to push an advertisement down your throat. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so, this itself is the first indication which should uh, cause some alarm for you that, look, what is this? And I, in fact, I received two, I receive a lot of mails every day. And yesterday night, I happened to receive two emails. So the next email was something like this. You can see it is dated uh, 9th March at 9 o'clock at night. From someone I don't even know. And uh, some transactions at gmail.com. It doesn't even have a ORG uh, uh, URL. Some gmail.com. So it says, Dear Professor, I wonder if you have uploaded your proposal for a special issue via this link. Okay. You can upload now your own special issue. Benefits, honorarium policy, contact us. Okay. Successful special issue organizer will be included in the steering committee of two important conferences. So what is this committee? What is this important conference? No one knows. Successful special issue organizers will receive a certificate for the organization of their special issue by the editor in chief. Okay, so what do you mean by certificate? It's a piece of paper. What is the value? Who determines the validity or value of the certificate? Then uh, the organizers will have a good chance to be promoted to editor in chief. Okay, 
So you can see this language they have written. Their, their session and their name will appear on the web after the end of the publication of the papers of the special issue. And you can enhance your CV as guest editor in a special issue. So these are uh, like red drags to a bull, okay? The moment you say enhance your CV, many people immediately want to uh, see what it is all about, okay? Uh, because many of our colleagues are always behind uh, improving their CVs all the time. And of course, there's some fine print down there, limitations, something, 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 cannot be from the same country, or you can organize, cannot be involved in the review process, conflict of interest, uh, as if that they are really worried about all these ethical issues. So this is a very typical way of aggressive uh, promotion of uh, advertising of uh, uh, God only knows what it is. And uh, so this is a typical example of a predatory uh, effort. So then what actually is meant by predatory publishers or journals? So till recently, there was a problem in trying to even give a proper definition to this predatory journals. Okay. So this uh, set of people, uh, finally they published this in the na nature. Uh, so they have uh, put down a definition and this was a very concerted effort by a group of uh, people and institutions, not just one or two people. So it says that predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation. So this is the definition of a predatory journal in a nutshell. I urge all of you to go through this uh, paper. Uh, this uh, is an open, uh, accessible to everyone, this paper, in the nature, it appeared in December 2000. Thank you. <laughs> Very well written paper. <clears throat> so, what is the motive for all these predatory journals and publishers? It's very simple. They are driven purely by the motive of making money and more money. And this is at the expense of scientific scholarship. They have absolutely no scruples and they attract very gullible researchers and faculty members also through very, very aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation, like repeated emails. In fact, uh, if you have been uh, publishing papers reasonably uh, well in the last few years, your emails are known to everyone on the internet. So these people, they troll the, uh, the internet and then pick up all these addresses. And the next step is to go on bombarding you with uh, these emails. It's very much like uh, all these uh, loan companies and credit card companies calling you day in and day out on your mobile phone. Absolutely the same way. And they charge fees for publication, but without undergoing any ethical publishing practices like scientific peer review or editing. And they just simply perpetuate bad research in general. <clears throat> so how do you distinguish which are these predatory journals and which are genuine journals. And mind you, these people are very, very clever. The way they name the journal, you feel that uh, it is almost like a, a genuine uh, journal. They're very similar to the existing uh, reputed subscription-based journals or even some of the new open access journals which are already established. They sound very similar, okay? 
and they just tweak one word here and there so that uh, it, it, there will be finally some difference between uh, uh, an established uh, journal name and its predatory journal. So they are very often actually they give false and misleading information on their websites. So if you go to any of these predatory journal websites, it appears totally different. Suppose you first visit uh, uh, a normal reputed uh, website, uh, journal website, like say American Federal Society, and then you visit these kind of uh, websites, you'll see the difference immediately. They put up very dubious mission statements, and contact information will be some uh, street somewhere in uh, some God only knows place. Then their impact factors, they also put up impact factors, but they never tell you how they have arrived at those impact factors. Okay. Then they also show that they are members of so and so association, this association, that association, but no proof is given and they're usually false. And then the editorial board members, if you just glance through the names of these board members, you'll wonder who these people are. You just see in, in your own area of research, you go to uh, a reputed journal in your area of research, go to editorial board members list. I'm sure you'll be able to recognize at least two or three or four of those people if you have been working in a particular research area for some time. But if you go and visit these websites and look at the editorial board members list, you'll know almost no one there. And their conditions are also will be very subjective. You never, you'll not even know who these people are, where they have come from, whether they are really scientists or not. Then the next thing you should do is whether uh, you have to check whether these predatory publishing uh, houses or journals, they are members of this WASPA or this directory of open access journals, DOHJ, or whether they are members of this POPE. Committee on Publication Ethics, and whether they appear in this typical uh, indexes, okay, like your Science Citation Index, SCI, etc., and databases for their uh, associated disciplines. So this is one more check one could do to distinguish these priority journals. Then for any journal which in principle follows ethical practices. They should actually, and they do spell out how the peer review process uh, works. And it's very clearly highlighted in the journal website. And also they give very proper guidelines for authors as well as reviewers. Now, a total lack of transparency in these factors this uh, distinguishes them immediately. Also, they don't say anything about the, uh, the uh, APCs, the article processing charges beforehand. Okay. They will tell you once your paper gets ac is accepted, they will say, look, you'll have to pay this much of charge for the article formation. And there's a total lack of transparency, as I said, in the editorial report. And then another thing which you will notice when you visit the website is that any journal, usually, this predatory journal, it will be willing to publish anything on this earth. Whether you say that you are working in physics, chemistry, life sciences, social sciences, or anything, doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Okay. So they'll have a huge range of topics. You say, you can send your paper. No problem, we'll publish. Okay. <clears throat> so these are the kind of uh, 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 red flags, I would say, that uh, can easily be used to distinguish between uh, the well meaning journals and the predatory journals. And what are the consequences of uh, publishing in these uh, predatory journals? See, generally when you publish, or whenever you do even research itself, scientific research, genuine scientific research, you expect that they should help in gaining knowledge, 
for the overall good of the society, be it in fields of technology, health, or uh, anything, medicine, anything. Okay. So when a research of really dubious quality gets published, okay, especially in the fields of medicine, you see, it can really lead to disastrous results with very high potential of harm to patients. And this has actually happened in many cases. Because when you look at a, a patient, say a, a, a desperate, desperate patient who is say, terminally ill with some disease, he is desperate for cure. And suppose some guy uh, publishes a paper in this predatory journal okay, saying that, yes, we have a cure for this particular disease. You do this, you do this, you take this, you take that. People are willing to believe it because it's a matter of life and death. Okay? And they may as well even try those uh, possibilities. And which may, in fact, uh, create even more trouble or harm. So uh, <clears throat> then there's another problem. Suppose uh, you have uh, some paper uh, uh, is published in a predatory uh, journal, and now you have another article in a mainstream uh, subscription-based journal or an open access journal, and if this paper happens to get cited in uh, the paper of a mainstream journal, that also leads to the corruption of uh, the scientific information. Okay, because the references are a very important aspect of any paper. So when people refer to, uh, say, uh, a very dubious publication without knowing about it, it could be unintentional, without knowing about it, just referred, then uh, you may even follow that. And uh, it, basically, it's like a, uh, uh, what is this, a worm which is infecting your system. Okay. and. Uh, can uh, lead to scientific credibility taking a big hit on uh, for this reason. Then another very bad thing which happens is that uh, careers of young researchers, scholars, they get unnecessarily damaged when they publish in such journals. Because it reflects very poorly on their scientific integrity and also makes their credentials questionable. Now the problem is, uh, <clears throat> Why do, uh, why do young researchers uh, at all publish these uh, journals, predatory journals? So this question will answer very soon. And then uh, not only the uh, researchers, but also the institutional profiles of the researchers who publish in these journals, predatory journals, they also get affected due to this very negative impact on the accrediting agencies like NAC, et cetera, in our country. And also it has happened that uh, there are many instances where articles did not get published even after payment of uh, article processing charges, so resulting in all your money going down the drain. So finally and ultimately these predatory journals can result in a huge waste of time, efforts and money for scientists to publish in such journals, also affecting their credibility, their institution's credibility and reputation. So it would have been much better off if they actually spent the same efforts in publishing in uh, established journals. So why do people publish in these predatory journals? So it's like playing with the devil. One of the main reasons is publish of perish quality. So you know that uh, there are norms like one has to have at least two publications per year if you want to maintain your tenure uh, or your employment. This works mostly in the West. Also, unfortunately, our own uh, system in the country, especially uh, concerning research scholars, it says that uh, during the course of your PhD, at the end of your PhD, you must have at least two research publications in course reputed journals. Okay. So there's a mad uh, scramble for publishing, and uh, people fall prey to these uh, temptations and then uh, go ahead and publish in the journals. 
Other reason could be total rank ineptitude handling your research work and also having inadequate research skills to undertake your research work. So these reasons are also, uh, uh, these uh, issues are also one of for uh, publishing in predatory journals. Then unhealthy competition. This is another problem. You always want to be one up with your colleague. If you if colleague has 100 publications, you want to have 101 publications. And if you are unable to do that uh, in a certain uh, given length of time, you resort to this kind of uh, unhealthy, uh, unethical way of publishing. And mind you, these journals uh, offer uh, publishing your paper in say two or three days also, if you give enough money. Suppose you have an interview coming up in say in three days time, and then you realize that you are say one short number, one number short in your number of papers. You can write to any of these journals, pay to them and send them a manuscript and get accepted the next day. So your number is made up, okay. So this is all also uh, very unethical practices which uh, people uh, adopt sometimes. And then uh, lack of awareness. Sometimes because unknowingly people submit uh, to these journals because of their aggressive advertisements and uh, things like that. So people uh, sometimes fall prey and then submit their uh, papers. And that also happens uh, sometimes. So these are uh, some of the reasons uh, where uh, find that people uh, resort to publishing in uh, predatory uh, journals. And uh, so how do you stop these uh, predatory uh, journals? And one needs really dedicated and sincere efforts uh, to root out this uh, pernicious practice. And it's not a one man's job or one country's job. Several people and countries have to get, I mean, when I say countries, I mean the science bodies in the country, they have to get together in a concerted manner and make efforts to stop this kind of uh, predatory publishing. Mind you, these people are very smart people. Whatever people try to do, they try to go one up on them and try to adapt their uh, systems, et cetera, to overcome the barriers. So the only way out again is, as I said, creating pr proper awareness on the practices and tactics of these predators, especially among young research scholars. And this would go a really long way in uh, preventing people from publishing predatory journals. So as I said, the scientific community needs to collectively take up cudgels against these journals and make sure that they get exposed all the time. And if you look at our own Indian initiative in this regard, the University Grants Commission has really undertaken a massive exercise to combat this predatory publishing by establishing this UGC care. And it is expected that in the coming years, this uh, UGC care would uh, really help and uh, not only in the case of predatory journals, but it will be of uh, uh, big help in other issues, especially for uh, young research scholars and young faculty members on various aspects on scientific integrity and ethics. And also protecting their intellectual property. So uh, I think uh, we now almost come to the end of this uh, lecture series. So what did I do uh, in this uh, course of uh, 10 lectures? I started initially with some uh, introduction to philosophy and ethics. Then I told you something about uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, honesty and uh, scientific uh, ethics and uh, ethics in scientific research. Then uh, I talked about uh, research integrity, how important it is. Then I also uh, told you about the scientific misconducts like fabrication, falsification, plagiarism, among others. Then the host of other issues like uh, written publications. Then how scientific misconduct can take place 
like selective reporting and data misrepresentation and many other uh, things which happened. I also showed you several case histories uh, which illustrate all these uh, uh, points. Then I also told you about uh, the ethical committees which exist for various aspects of maintaining ethics in scientific research. Then I switched over to publication ethics and told you about uh, how important these publications are and uh, how do scientific journals uh, also maintain a code of ethics for themselves. And also I told you what happens if these guidelines and uh, uh, code of ethics are broken and what it results in and several issues like conflict of interest and unethical behavior, uh, not only by the scientists, but also on part of the uh, scientific journal and how it results in violation of publication ethics. And authorship issues was another big major problem, especially in the context of our country and how one can uh, do uh, appealing uh, in order to uh, push your manuscript if it has been rejected. And finally, today, of course, I told you about this, the ability to and publishers. So I think uh, all of you, what I've tried to give you is basically just some essence about all these things, how uh, uh, how do you tackle all these uh, issues, etc. So now the ball is in your court. You will have to go out and find out for yourself and uh, read more and uh, and I hope this will also help you uh, to to be more uh, to be ethical or maintain your uh, ethics in uh, science, science, scientific research now and in future also. So I have given some references uh, at the end for further uh, reading, and uh, so they are all well known, and most of you already must be knowing about these uh, websites, the Publication Ethics website for Cope. Retraction Watch and ICMG, or then uh, this one particular uh, uh, site I wanted you to see is National Workshop on Publication Ethics and Scientific Writing. The set of about uh, six or seven lectures which have been put on YouTube by the uh, IU Center of Excellence under the Pune University. And uh, one can actually, if you just Google this, you can see this on the YouTube. And there's some very uh, excellent lectures given by some top people about uh, six or seven lectures on uh, ethics and uh, and science. And uh, I strongly advise you to see this uh, website. Then of course, there's another website called thinkcheckssubmit.org. Again, uh, to help you uh, identify which are these predatory journals and publishers. And uh, this book I have already told you about, Ethics of Science, an introduction by Resnick. And then UGC has published uh, two volumes. Uh, one is Academic Integrity and Research Quality, and then Good Academic Research Practices. Most of you would have already downloaded these books. And uh, then there was a, another book by Dr. Chadda, which was called Ethics in Competitive Research, Do Not Get Schooled, Do Not Get Plagiarized. And this is also a very good book. I advise you to read this. Uh, I'm sure it is available online. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, having listened to all these uh, lectures so patiently. And now I would like to throw open this uh, session for a discussion. And uh, so you can uh, probably uh, show yourself and uh, raise your hands in case you have any uh, questions uh, about uh, any of these uh, 10 lectures and uh, so I'll be, uh, you can also even unmute yourself if you want to raise your hand and even discuss. Is there any cost involved in the peer review process? Uh, uh, does the publisher pay, does the publisher pay? Uh, I lost it. Yeah. Uh, does the publisher pay a reviewer? Uh, 
usually no publisher doesn't pay to review or anything i have reviewed several articles i don't get anything and there is no cost involved in this peer review process the next question uh, transfer of copyright for the means only for the paper content or even the ipr uh, no, it's not the IPR, it's the paper content and uh, as of now on the subscription based journal, the transfer of copyright is for the paper content. Uh, is, it is not clear that e-journals are not discovered. Yeah, what I said was that, suppose you take, uh, uh, for example, uh, Nature. Nature is a very popular journal. So, Nature most of the articles in nature are based on subscription. That means you must have a subscription in order to access these uh, articles in the journal nature. But some of the articles in any issue of, the, uh, of nature, if you just go and see, they will be marked as open access. So you will know about this only when you go to that uh, particular uh, issue uh, on the website and then open it and look at the uh, table of content or something or uh, even sometimes go to that particular uh, article in order to know that that particular article is open access. So it's not so easily discoverable just like that. There is no advertisement uh, in Google or anywhere saying that this particular uh, article is open access. So unless you go to that site, you will not Well, there's still a little bit of time left. So in case anyone of you wants to say something or ask something, you're, uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Can you please upload all the lectures? I think that's what uh, HBNI is going to do. So you can visit the website and, uh, 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 or other Vidya site and you'll have all these uh, lectures available there. I have a question related to SciHub website as it provides the content to users free of charge without having the journal. Are we violating any law if we use it for downloading any article? In principle, yes, the copyright laws are violated when you download these articles. Uh, I specifically didn't say much about this uh, SciHub uh, because it's a rather sensitive uh, issue. Uh, but since you have raised this topic, I'll try to uh, explain this. See, basically this website has been started uh, somewhere in Russia. And uh, of course, this also is an ethical question. You see, all scientific knowledge is meant for the good of people, for the good of society. Why should this scientific knowledge, which is meant for good of society, locked up? in the form of subscriptions in journals. Why should you pay to access the scientific knowledge, which is supposed to be for the good of all society? So that's an ethical question here. So what is uh, the problem? And uh, nobody has any clear answer. And these big journal uh, publishing houses, they in fact, they try to shut down this, uh, this website, but they have not been successful because the moment they try to shut down uh, one particular site in uh, operating from one uh, region. There are many such uh, site, uh, mirror sites which immediately open up. And uh, so the matter, I would rest the matter at that. So you should draw your inferences from whatever I've said so far. Uh, which journals are more expensive, open access or predatory journals? Definitely open access journals are, are more expensive. Otherwise, predatory journals cannot make any money because if you had to pay the same amount as you do to a predatory journal, you would rather uh, use it for a well-established open access journal. So while open access journal may ask you for $3,000, this guy may say, okay, you pay me uh, $500. And suppose you can even bargain. You say, I don't have $500, I have only $100. And say, okay, fine, you pay me $100. So things can go on to that extent also. So it is something like that. So what are predatory conferences? Yeah. So the first instance which I showed you on this slide today 
of the Chinese, uh, uh, whatever has been written in Chinese there. So that most probably, of course, I have not bothered to check what it was. It was it came in yesterday night. And I'm sure it's a predatory conference where they simply say that you'll have to pay this much money and uh, we'll make you editor-in-chief, we'll make you the in charge of the uh, proceedings and so and so, so and so, so and so. And uh, ultimately, you may find that there is no conference, nothing and uh, all those things. And you, your name may still appear in some website somewhere saying that you are the editor or whatever. But then it has absolutely no meaning. So these are those predatory conferences. And there are many such conferences which are appearing all over the world now. It's simply, you have to just go through the, 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 the conference advisory board and you can immediately see. See, suppose it is a, a conference is supposed to be on, say, a, a, say, superconductivity, okay? And if it's an international conference on superconductivity, I'm sure at least two or three big names in, in, in superconductivity must be there in the international advisory board of that conference. If you find all unknown names, it should immediately uh, ring a bell in your, in, in your brain that, look, there's something wrong with this uh, conference. Okay, so it's very clear on that. I asked you one question in the course of the lecture. I said if all the print uh, journals, uh, subscription-based journals, they actually turn open access, what will happen to our Indian science and Indian journals? Can anyone uh, uh, probably uh, raise their hands or something and then uh, answer this question? Sir, I think it will be very difficult. Once more, please. Pardon? Can you unmute yourself and then say it again, please? Sir, Amrit Pal Singh, you are trying to say something. Anyone else would like to answer that question? If all subscription-based journals turn into open access and you are required to pay money, what will you do? What is your suggestion? Yeah, so Sumit Kuchar. So that uh, appears to be a hypothetical situation because if all of them turn to an open access uh, journal, the market will be closed. I mean, uh, the publication would uh, stop cease actually, and then uh, the entire business will go down. Not necessarily. Their entire business is based in the West. And now mo most of the Western funding agencies, they are insisting that uh, they are paying and saying that you must put your papers on the open access. How about the volumes? How many, how many, how many uh, research papers? No problem. That's what I'm trying to say. See, these, these uh, publishing houses are mainly surviving on papers from the Western scientists, not from Indian scientists. Okay. Okay. So, uh, if, okay. Even if it is hypothetical, what will be your answer in the Indian context? Probably we may have to look for something like make in India our own uh, uh, repository, our own uh, publishing uh, houses. They are already there. That is the right answer. What you have said is correct. Why don't you publish in Indian journals? Okay. Unfortunately, people don't do this. And I have told you one very nice example about uh, the issue of water on the moon, which was actually discovered by ISRO before it was discovered by NASA. And they insist, uh, the ISRO people went on insisting that uh, it should be published in uh, nature or science or whatever, and simply waited three months for that. And they didn't do anything else in this period of three months. They could have simply 
written up a paper and sent it to current science in the Indian uh, journal. What's the problem? They could have easily had their uh, 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 priority on this discovery, but they didn't do that. Okay. So it's, I think it's time that uh, we actually support Indian journals, make them more scientifically relevant and publish, start publishing our results in Indian journals also. I'm not saying you should do it only in Indian journals. I think it is time that people start publishing in Indian journals also. Okay, that's a good uh, uh, answer. So how to increase Indian journal impact factor? That's what I said. Now, if everyone starts publishing uh, in Indian journals, and, and there's no uh, doubt that the impact factor is going to increase. In fact, this is what happened by force in, for example, Russia. Russia, when it was uh, still in the old days, USSR days, the Russian scientists were actually forced to publish in the Russian journal. And you, you see some of the most uh, brilliant papers which uh, appear in those uh, uh, Russian journals, so much so that most of the journals are now translated into English by the Western publishing houses. And that's how we come to know all these excellent papers which have been published in Russian journals. So, uh, I think that this is, this is like uh, who is going to bell the cat. So, unless you start publishing in Indian journals, uh, uh, this matter will not uh, change. This situation will not change. So, uh, people are saying, okay, if journals or uh, papers are published in Indian journals, it may not be possible to receive enough citations. This is not entirely correct. I also showed you an example where my own uh, re uh, reference to my own institute's uh, uh, newsletter was made in a physical uh, an IOP paper, okay, uh, Journal of Physics uh, paper. So it's not that you will be not be cited. I'm sure if I had uh, published my result at that time in the in, in Indian journal, I'm sure it would have been uh, cited uh, uh, in, a, uh, in, in any other journal also. So it's like one has to start doing this now, okay? So it's the onus is not on just uh, research scholars. I'm not saying that. It's onus is on everyone. In fact, it's our own uh, UGC which should, in fact, start saying this. They should stop uh, uh, stop making uh, these uh, like you must have this much of uh, citations, this much of impact factor. You must be publishing papers in. Uh, a, a journal of minimum this much impact factor. See, these conditions have been put by our own people. So once these conditions are removed, I am sure things will start to change. You stop making uh, citations and uh, impact factor as the basis of judging the paper. Rather than that, make people see the quality of the paper, objectivity there, and then judge a paper. I think that only that will change the outlook. So UGC hardly this any Indian journal in list of recommended journals. Why, why would any young researcher then try to publish in Indian journals? Similarly for job opportunities in the US. That's what I'm saying. The onus is not just on you. The onus is equally on the UGC also. They have to change their attitudes. And I'm sure in the next coming years, this is going to happen and is supposed to happen. And uh, a lot of changes I, I'm sure are going to be uh, coming up in the next uh, few years. So you can see the whole scenario will be changing probably by the time you people go into uh, the middle of your careers, uh, wherever you will be. I'm sure the whole scenario will be changing. Yeah, any other questions? Do, 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 you, do you mean that this impact factor is not uh, making any sense in uh, rating the content of the paper, the quality of the paper? No, no, I'm not saying that. See, how did this come about? Okay, I can give you 100 uh, papers uh, which have been published, say, in a, a journal like Nature, which are absolutely, absolutely, what would you say to that? Okay. So, an impact factor is not the sole, should not be the sole criteria for judging a paper. That's what I'm trying to say. There are papers in very good journals like Nature or Science or whatever, which are absolutely and they got through somehow, whatever way, whichever way, uh, unethical or not, I don't know, but they have gone through and uh, there's many papers and uh, nature and things like that. And many have been retracted also, okay? And uh, they're just, so what did you say to that? Okay, so what I'm trying to 
uh, impress upon you is that impact factor is good, yes, at the moment, but I'm sure it's not going to be in the future. It is going to change. Yeah, I think uh, we can stop here. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, then, uh, in case you have any uh, questions, you please uh, send me an email if you wish, and I will be very happy to uh, answer your questions. And I think we'll meet on Monday again when uh, I'll be giving you the uh, assignment on this uh, lectures. Thank you very much. <laughs>